Welcome once again to Breakfast Central. Now, moving the conversation further, Nigeria has one of the largest youth populations in the world with a median age of 18.1 years. About 70% of the country's population are also under 30, while 42% are under the age of 15. Now, in spite of this huge youth population, there is a huge margin between the older generation and the newer generation in the political landscape, or the younger generation rather. There have been also calls by, or for more youth participation in Nigerian politics in order for the youth to understand the nitty-gritty of political leadership in the country. Now, if there is one thing worthy of note about Nigeria's just-concluded presidential elections, it's of course the high level of involvement of Nigerian youth in the start to the finish of the elections. What we saw can be said to never have been seen before in a long time. Amidst this is a large number of youth who have developed massive distrust for the Independent National Electoral Commission and its handling of the elections. This can be felt from the social media posts and the groanings of dissatisfaction. At the forefront of these are members of Nigeria's entertainment industry, championing this movement which can be said to have begun from the NSARS movement. A movement which began in October on the 20th, uh, 2020, to end police brutality. We have with us someone who has been very passionate about this movement. He's been called the voice of the people, a musician, a lawyer, and has been a big part of this new dimension of Nigerian youth participation in politics. We're talking about Pals the Bad Guy. Good to have you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Polari Falano is um, a name that has you know, become a worldwide sensation, not just because of your conscious music, but also because of the role that you play in politics. We also know that your father was a, is a very important part of, you know, advocating for a better life for Nigerians. And I'd like to, you know, talk to you about the elections. You know, that's why we're all here. Let's go back to the elections that held, the presidential elections, and get your thoughts on it. You did share a lot about it, but first of all, how's your mental health? <laughs> then how was the election? Um, I'm well. I'm well. I'm, I'm, I'm coping. As almost every Nigerian is, I, I'm coping. I'm coping. Barely surviving. All right. Then, then give us a, a brief recap of how that day was for you. We know that you were in the forefront of uh, sharing updates on the attacks at your polling unit. What yeah. was it like? Um, uh, started off rough. Uh, you know, obviously going into the elections, everyone was already a bit apprehensive. Uh, because of our history, you know, history of electoral malpractices, electoral violence, and all that stuff. So everyone was already, you know, uh, a, a bit apprehensive. So when we got there, I was trying to real-time feed, uh, uh, you know, on social media what was going on at my polling unit. And just as I was recording uh, a live video, a couple touts had, you know, started causing chaos in my polling unit and I just saw people moving like moving towards where I was and I was moving back you know in regular fashion like what's in the apple where everybody they move like this make me safe move <laughs> so just as I was back stepping some guy just snatched my phone and you know just ran away with it and I realized that you know the reason why people were moving is because these touts had come and they were just snatching phones whoever had their phone up you know, remotely recording or doing anything, they would just, you know, snap because of what they were about to do. They didn't want people to see that, um, you know, and immediately after that, they started kicking ballot boxes, you know, causing all sorts of chaos. And I think they, there was a guy that they really beat up. Uh, they beat him and his mom up. His mom apparently was about like 80 years old or something. Yeah, um, it was really, it was really crazy and I, I think after that the guy and his mom left because obviously you know who's gonna take that um uh it was it was it was chaotic it was pretty chaotic there, there there's been a lot of people who you know have expressed you know different levels of disappointment you know with the whole process they've um you know described it as very very not credible they've said INEC failed them you know and um you know these are a lot of young people who you know, we at this point even fear that they may not want to participate in Nigerian, uh, you know, elections going for, um, forward. But I want you to, you know, I want to get your thoughts on the process. Um, do you, would you join those who say that INEC failed Nigerians and failed the young Nigerians who decided to participate at this time? Yeah. Uh, and what for you was the most shocking uh, part of the whole process for, um, on the 25th of February? I would definitely join them. <laughs> Um, if I'm not the first person to say that, safe. 
Um, it was extremely shambolic. It was it was ter it was it was terrible. It was a mess. Um, I think what was most shocking <laughs> to me was the fact that the INEC chairman, who I personally think has put out or has you know displayed the most embarrassing uh, 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 display that we've ever seen from any INEC chairman, um, he constantly and consistently, unprovoked, nobody asked him, reassured Nigerians that on election day, transmission of results will be via the BVAS system. The reason the BVAS system was introduced in the first place was to mitigate these issues, to solve this problem of rigging. Yeah. And um, he constantly and consistently reassured Nigerians that that was going to be up and running and on the day, it just didn't work. So for me, I think that was probably the most shocking thing, especially because this person consistently said, oh, this is what we're going to use. And um, if I'm being honest with you, what we, the point where we were able to reach in terms of the entire electoral process, I think is probably the best possible it can be for a country like Nigeria, because it's a perfect hybrid system. Now, the actual voting system is very manual, you know, you literally thumbprint on a physical sheet of paper. Everybody does that one by one. And then in front of all agents uh, uh, for each party, they count the votes. Yeah. So everyone witnesses the counting one by one. Okay, Labour Party, so-so amount. APC, so-so amount. PDP, so-so amount. Everyone witnesses that. Then the electoral officer signs a result sheet with the result that everyone can attest to. Yes. And then what they're supposed to do, <laughs> which they didn't do, of course, is take a photo of that result sheet and immediately upload it to the uh, uh, portal. So that real time, of course, some people will, uh, will finish voting before others, but real time, you can start checking polling unit by polling unit, start putting together what the results are. Nothing went up. Yeah, but, but what about, you know, I mean, so the INEC chairman, you know, over time in the last couple of days, they've moved between saying that they, were, they had technical glitches, you know, to saying, that um, you know, some of the staff were poorly trained, and I remember we spoke about this yesterday yes, that they did. needed to uh, retrain more, you know, their staff better, ad hoc staff better, and of course, you know, um, maybe even sack some of them that failed. So, I mean, would you would you agree with the narrative that his intentions were pure, and that means that what, from when he spoke at Chatham House to when he spoke at every other interview, assuring Nigerians that this is the process that would be used, that was the intention, but it just happens that you know. Nigeria, Nigerian. In the grand scheme, <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, it's incredibly difficult to conceive, to possibly conceive the idea that his intentions were ever pure. It's incredibly difficult. Let's start from the budget <laughs> to run this election. Three hundred billion. Yeah. How can you come and then tell me you had technical issues? Uh, uh, poorly trained staff. Come on, with this, this is. This, I personally think this is a ridiculous amount of money. But let's not even go into that. You had this. Just make it work. You had one job. Just make it work. But how possibly expensive can it be to set up a? Po this is a booming tech era. Yes, we sir. have. We were just talking about it. A such a high. A population of young people in this country people that are very tech savvy if you have problems on the technical side there's a big amount of people that can help you out with that so you can't come with excuses eh, they hacked your system or oh, eh, your server was down what what is that mess how can you say that your server was down in a in the presidential election for the entire country of over 200 and something million people that you had this long to plan for and this much money to work with. I th like I said earlier on, I think this was an extremely embarrassing display from Mahmoud Yakubu. All right, now you've talked about the fact that we had sufficient money, over 300 billion was allocated for the planning of the elections. Unfortunately, there have been lots of reports, not just from one person, lots of reports about inconsistency, not just in the telling, but also in updating the results. You have spoken very passionately on your page about how this is a violation of the Electoral Act, and I'd like you to shed further light on that. Yes. Um, so just as I was explaining earlier on, uh, this system that we have right now, I think 
It's the best we can possibly have in a country like Nigeria. So what happened was that prior to this, there was no such thing as electoral transmission of results. Last, just last year, the Electoral Act was amended. After a lot of deliberation, and people were like, okay, we have to solve this problem of rigging. How can we solve this problem of rigging? Okay, how about we take out that element of carrying the ballot and moving from polling units to collation center? How about we transmit the results directly from the polling unit? And everyone agreed, oh, this is beautiful, wonderful. The Electoral, the electoral Act was amended accordingly. Now, the Electoral Act then gave uh, the chairman of INEC the power to make guidelines and regulations that would, you know, govern the, the entire process. And he, by himself, Mahmoud Yakubu, released the guidelines and regulations saying, okay, this is how it's going to work. Uh, you know, transmission will be via the BVAS. And on the day, he, by himself, violated that. You know, the act is not only illegal, in nowhere transparent how do you come <laughs> the next no the night of the election yeah. announce one state a kitty state from where did you get those results the next day you continue you're announcing these results in like tranches like what are you doing it everything just looks so shabby no one can even verify these results where are you getting these results from you know and a lot of result sheets surfaced on the internet where we'll see you know results clearly being altered and so so messy so what, what then is the way forward we've seen the labor party and the people's democratic party have criticized the results saying that they do not accept it labor party believes that they have won the elections as well and they're taking the matter to court uh, do you foresee that the court would maybe overturn the current situation as is and do you really have trust in the supreme court and its ability to be able to you know act as a fair check in this situation. I'm asking this because we have seen that there's a breach of trust between the bench and between the average Nigerians in some cases. Many of them have expressed their concern as to how they worry that there might be some influence, maybe in the Supreme Court or even the election petition tribunals. So do you, are you confident that the law will take its course? I see that the Supreme Court would be able to by its judgment, remedy the situation. However, I think what most people are worried about and what you're probably asking me about is whether everyone will be in compliance with the Supreme Court's judgment. What we've seen time after time is the executive arm of government refusing to listen to the judicial arm of government. And for a democracy to work, there has to be clear separation of powers, the checks and balances in place. The reason why that concept even exists, the reason why there are courts, is to check every other arm of government. Everyone has all these powers and they can't just be acting like it's a dictatorship. Everyone has to be subject to the law. Everyone is equal be before the law, regardless of who you are, even if you're the president. So we've seen you know, like, like uh, what you were telling me off air, we've seen a lot of instances where the president himself, Muhammad Buhari, refused to listen to the Supreme Court. So that's probably why, you know, everyone's apprehensive. What's going to happen? Is this going... <laughs> but I promise you, this can't be one of those. And I'd just like to quickly chip in that that particular reference would be, of course, the challenge with the Naira situation, where it seems that we're hearing one yeah. thing from the court and we're hearing something different from the uh, presidency. Now we still are, uh, I mean, the, the Supreme Court has extended the validity of the old Naira notes. And yeah. uh, we hope that everyone else will be able to catch on and that we can have free flow of cash in the, yeah, in the coming days. Yeah. I, I, I also want to, you know, um, you know, two things. I think I'm going to speak about, you know, the governorship elections that are coming up in a bit. You know, but also, I think one thing you notice in Nigeria is that there's no actual punishment for incompetence. You know, when people fail, you know, with their responsibilities, they are rewarded with more responsibilities mm -hmm. instead of, you know, being um, cautioned. But I, I want to and talk so, about so, these. So, very sorry to interrupt you. And, you know, just uh, as we're talking about the INEC chairman, and just to buttress your point, he's done this entire thing, but the law doesn't actually hold him criminally liable for this entire episode yeah. and i i find that 
wild. Because how do you get away with such an atrocity? And in a hypothetical situation that an INEC chairman has been compromised and has indeed benefited, you know, maybe by way of some, some sort of bribe, how do you then get punished for that? If anything, he's just going to jet off after this entire thing to go and enjoy his money. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why, you know, like, like I said, it, it seems like it's a culture, you know, that there is no actual punishment for incompetence, you know. But, you know, but unfortunately, it's at the highest level. You know, because if we do it at our level, you know, we are punished. You know, we are, you know, we are cautioned when we're incompetent. But you get higher on different levels and when you're incompetent, you know, everybody just goes Yeah, well, I was um, just also highlight quickly that, I mean, whilst there are a lot of people who have showed that discontent against the procedure and against the INEC president, who do not have any clear indications as to... Um, any clear facts as to the fact that he may have, I mean, you did mention something about bribe, collecting bribe. Yeah, that's why I said yeah. hypothetical yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I just wanted to yeah. clarify that. We do not know that. Yeah, I, 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 want, I want you to quickly speak on two things. You know, first of all, what would, the, would be the, um, now we're uh, talking about the courts. Um, the INEC, of course, is also moving to the courts to help stop the Labour Party and the PDP from assessing um, the uh, Beavers um, uh, files. And of course, you know, they're asking that it, they give them uh, authority to What's the word now to reconfigure, you know, Beavers before the governorship elections? So let's quickly talk, get your thoughts on that one. And then also, one thing that I would like you to speak on is there's all the young people like you um, across Nigeria's social media space that are also campaigning for their candidates, are also pushing different narratives. But what we've seen in the last 48 hours, mostly on social media, is a lot of bigotry, a lot of tribalism. There's so much of that that is going on. Um, so I want to get how that makes you feel, you know, seeing that these are educated, learned, um, not hungry young men like yourself um, who have taken the path of bigotry as their way of campaigning for their candidates. But let's first talk about Beavers before we get there. Okay. Uh, okay, what about Beavers? Um, I neck, you know, I'm, so I'm, I'm just even going to quote from the this day newspaper. <laughs> exactly. The front page of this day newspaper says, INEC's application to court to reconfigure Beavers raising integrity questions. So they're applying to the court to reconfigure Beavers. And this is, of course, raising some uh, integrity questions. The commission harps on the need to reset devices before their deployment for governorship and state house of assembly polls. And of course, the PDP and Labour Party are saying that when you reconfigure it, it loses all the information that was that they are meant to go through for their court case, you know, based on presidential elections. <sighs> But look at all this, man. It's, it's, <laughs> let, let's it's laughable. <laughs> it's, it's laughable. You know, we're already saying to you that you've conducted this entire process in such a shabby manner. And this thing that you said you would use, you didn't even use properly. Now you're coming to say that you want to even cancel everything again and start afraid. What, what are you doing? I think this is an absolute mess. I think Mamoudi Akubu, like I said earlier on, should be terribly, terribly embarrassed with himself. This, this whole thing, this entire episode, has been the worst conducted elections that I've witnessed in my lifetime. You know, going into the governorship election, there is absolutely no reason why the beavers should not be functioning. There's absolutely no reason why people should go there cast their votes at every single polling unit and those results shouldn't be transmitted directly from those polling units real time there's absolutely no reason why that should not be happening okay right. now, so, now let's get you to talk about um yeah. uh, you know uh, the tribalism and bigotry that we've seen in the build-up to the governorship elections uh, mostly here in lagos i think I, I think it's stupid i think it's senseless i think i think it is is, is absolutely repulsive um, all those comments, all those things, but I also think it's, <laughs> I find it funny because I think it's it's um, genuinely pretentious. It's genuinely pretentious, and I, personally, I can see through it. It's obviously concocted by um, some certain people for political intent. You know, they intend to turn this entire thing to some sort of tribal conflict. So people feel sentimental towards some certain candidates because of tribe. But for the people that have chopped it, for the Nigerians that have chopped it, that have, have internalized it, my questions to them will be, 
these same candidates that you're saying, oh, hey, because this person is also tribe, I want to vote for him. Okay, I have a few questions for you. When the real issues arise, when, you know, as a country, when we yeah. suffer as a people, the unemployment, the insecurity, everything that we're going through that is horrible and negative, are you exempted from that because of your tribe? No. Okay, good. When these people are misappropriating funds meant for the public, do they call you to say, oh yeah, come and take your own, because you are not part? Good. Now, this is why I said it's deeply pretentious. What really is that thing that is making you say, oh, I want to hold on to this candidate for tribe? How true to your tribe is that candidate or even you? What else have, like, it's so fake. Can we even <laughs> ever move beyond uh, running politics that is void of sentiments, be it religious, tribal, or just some sense of loyalty? Is it possible to, you know, ever completely move from politics that is not, that doesn't have some bit of sentiment, tribal, religious, or otherwise? Um, maybe not. You know, it's almost inevitable that this will, uh, this sort of sentiments will continue to arise because there will always be people that are very shallow. You know, very, very shallow in the sense that I can't see beyond this thing. You know, I can't see beyond the tribe. I can't reason to the point that I, I can say, okay, I'm supposed to be choosing a candidate based on competence. Yeah. Because it's work that the person is there to do. I'm not just looking for somebody from my tribe. Mm, this person is going to do a, a, a certain type of work for me and for the entire country. So why is tribe or religion even a question? in this scenario so there will always be people like that so I, I don't know that we can ever completely move away from that but i know that we'll get to a point where something like tribe alicia i know about religion because religion i don't know it's you know it's like a, a sacred thing but um something like tribe will probably not matter as much anymore and the way that they're chopping people right now they probably wouldn't be able to chop them anymore i i i sincerely hope yeah yeah. Um, I also want you to talk about, you know, other people in the industry like yourself. Uh, there has been, in the last couple of weeks or months, um, calls for people to join. They even called you the real African giant. I remember I saw that. Uh, so there have, there have been criticism, you know, for people who didn't speak up or who were not part of the conversation um, in the build up to the elections. You know, so let's you know, quickly get your thoughts on the calls for more Nigerian artists, you know, both in the music industry and in Nollywood and, you know, whatnot, to um, lend a voice and, and not stay silent when these things are happening yeah. um, across the country? I think, I think what it is, um, and, you know, from, from like a celebrity perspective, I think for people that have probably been on the receiving end of this backlash, they should, I, I would maybe appeal to them to not look at it as like people just wanting to attack them for no reason. I see where it's coming from. It's from a place of hurt. And, um, you know, it's almost like human nature to turn on someone when you feel like they should be on your side and, you know, they should be doing more and they, they're in a position to do more, you know. So it's not, you know, I, I wouldn't like for us to antagonize each other. It's not a good thing, you know. It, this is probably the worst time for us to ever antagonize each other. This is a time where we need to be together, be on the same page as much as possible as a people oh, yeah. um i think as celebrities if you're in a position of influence if you have a voice i think that you should use that voice to your uh, uh, uh to, to your best ability um if you however do not have anything to say as regards any issue it's also not by force to speak oh yeah right. i don't feel anyone should be forced um but like i said earlier on if you're in a position uh, uh where you do have a voice and a a big level of influence then i would love that that be used for good let's talk about uh, celebrities who have used their influence to speak in support of certain candidates that they prefer we've seen different celebrities <laughs> throwing their weights behind different presidential candidates and governorship candidates now some of these celeb celebrities have accused young people of bullying and trolling them uh, talking of the mob mentality and cancel culture uh, i'd like to find out what your thoughts are on that because it does seem according to some of the celebrities they've said that when they do not throw their weights behind the ones that or the candidates that the majority or maybe some other young people yeah. would prefer they're being cancelled i'd like you to throw in your thoughts on that i find it funny um but at the same time, not funny, because I see where people are coming from. Uh, for, for the ones that have fueled 
the tribalism and bigotry that we spoke of earlier on, I say they 100% deserve the bullying that they're getting because that is stupid of them. Um, it's, such a, it, it's such an evil thing to, to put, you know, fuel. And I've seen celebrities, celebrities that I thought had some sense in them. I've seen them blatantly fueling this thing, this tribalism and bigotry. So, in such a senseless manner, I think those ones deserve the bullying. However, for the other people that have just come to say, oh, this is my preferred candidate, you know, everyone, of course, like we know, should be free, free from any attack. You know, I should be able to say, this is my preferred candidate, and I stand by that. However, we know what we are going through as a country, you know, and we know the people that have kept us here as a country. So when those people come with their full chest and say, this is who I su uh, support, I see why people attack them. However, it's not okay. You know, nobody should be bullied because of their choice of candidate. But those people too, they should think about it. Look at this so far. He's going around. Them too, they are feeling it. Ah, ah. ah. I mean, we're counting down to the elections. The gubernatorial elections are in a few days. And yep. we do hope that we have better reports and that we're having you here and everyone is smiling because Beavers was working. Results were uploaded in real time. There were no towns or thugs attacking people. That is the election that we're hoping for. Thank you so much, uh, Files the Bad Guy, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. You. All right, this has been Breakfast Central. We've been speaking with Falarin Falano, also known as Falls the Bad Guy. And we've talked about some of the uh, issues that have plagued the 2023 general elections, the highs and the lows. As we count down to the gubernatorial elections in a few days, we do urge every one of us to please go out and mass and vote. Do not be intimidated. Your voting is your right and it's your power. And you do not want anyone to take that away from you. Absolutely. And of course, uh, just a you know, reminder that we're looking forward to seeing everybody you know, who was out voting in, pre in the presidential elections. Even if you couldn't make it on the 25th of February, um, encourage people to come out to vote on the 11th of March this weekend. Um, be a part of it. Uh, might be a little discouraging for a lot of young people, you know, seeing the way it, it turned out you know, and the violence and some of all of that. But it shouldn't deter you from still coming out to vote. We encourage you and every other person, you know, who's at home uh, this morning to, you know, be a part of it. Thank you very much for staying with us and, of course, sharing your Tuesday morning with us. We hope that you enjoy the last two hours. Yeah. Um, we're going to be back here again tomorrow morning. Yes, very quickly in 30 seconds, Files. What would you say to women? Tomorrow is International Women's Day. Um, happy International Women's Day to every woman out there. Um, you know, keep being amazing, keep being the best version of yourself, and I hope that you have an amazing one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>